to part one. Part one. You will hear a man inquiring in a tourist centre about activities suitable for families. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hi, can I help you? I'd like to find out if you have any excursions suitable for families. Sure. How about taking your family for a cruise? We have a steamship that takes passengers out several times a day. It's over a hundred years old. That sounds interesting. How long is the trip? About an hour and a half. And don't forget to take pictures of the mountains. They're all around you when you're on the boat and they look fantastic. OK. And I assume there's a cafe or something on board? Sure. How old are your children? Uh, my daughter's 15 and my son's seven. Right. Well, there are various things you can do once you've crossed the lake to make a day of it. One thing that's very popular is a visit to the country farm. You're met off the boat by the farmer and he'll take you to the holding pens where the sheep are kept. Children love feeding them. <laughs> My son would love that. He really likes animals. Well, there's also a 40-minute trek round the farm on a horse if he wants. Do you think he'd manage it? He hasn't done that before. Sure. It's suitable for complete beginners. Ah, good. And again, visitors are welcome to explore the farm on their own, as long as they take care to close gates and so on. There are some very beautiful gardens along the side of the lake, which also belong to the farm. They'll be just at their best now. You could easily spend an hour or two there. OK, well, that all sounds good. And can we get lunch there? You can, and it's very good, though it's not included in the basic cost. You pay when you get there. Right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. So, is there anything else to do over on that side of the lake? Well, what you can do is take a bike over on the ship and then go on a cycling trip. There's a trail there called the Back Road. You could easily spend three or four hours exploring it, and the scenery's wonderful. They'll give you a map when you get your ticket for the cruise. There's no extra charge. What's the trail like in terms of difficulty? Quite challenging in places. It wouldn't be suitable for your seven-year-old. It needs someone who's got a bit more experience. Hmm. Well, my daughter loves cycling, and so do I. So maybe the two of us could go, and my wife and son could stay on the farm. That might work out quite well. But we don't have bikes here. Is there somewhere we could rent them? Yes. There's a place here in the city. It's called Ratchison's. I'll just make a note of that. Uh, how do you spell it? R-A-T-C-H-E-S-O-N-S. -E it's just by the cruise ship terminal. OK. You'd also need to pick up a repair kit for the bike from there to take along with you. And you'd need to take along a snack and some water. It'd be best to get those in the city. Fine. That shouldn't be a problem. And I assume I can rent a helmet from the bike place. Sure, you should definitely get that. It's a great ride, but you want to be well prepared because it's very remote. You won't see any shops around there or anywhere to stay, 
so you need to get back in time for the last boat. Yeah. So what sort of prices are we looking at here? Let's see. That'd be one adult and one child for the cruise with farm tour. That's $117. And an adult and a child for the cruise only, so that's $214 altogether. Oh, wait a minute. How old did you say your daughter was? Fifteen. Then I'm afraid it's $267, because she has to pay the adult fare, which is $75, instead of the child fare, which is $22. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, so how do we find that? That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a radio interview about a lakeside resort. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's show. The warm months are with us, and many of you are getting ready to plan vacation trips. To help you with that, we have a special guest today, Robert Sampson, director of the Golden Lake Resort. Robert, I understand Golden Lake is a popular place for families to spend their vacations. Yes, families enjoy spending time at Golden Lake. Many come back year after year. We have a spectacular location and fun activities for both children and adults. Could you describe for us some of the activities available at Golden Lake? We have a lot of water activities, of course, since we're right on the lake. We have a pleasant sandy beach for swimming. We also have canoes and sailboats available, and many of our guests enjoy boating on the lake. I imagine water skiing would be popular among your guests. Actually, we don't permit water skiing in the resort area. It can be dangerous for swimmers and for the canoeists, too. We do have a great location for fishing, for fishing though, and you'll often see guests fishing from our dock or from the canoes. That sounds very relaxing. What about activities on land? Do you have facilities for tennis? We had tennis in the past, but the courts fell out of repair. And since we found that most of our guests weren't interested in the game, we closed the courts down. So that's no longer an option. And naturally, because of our location in the woods, we don't have an adequate area for a golf course. But I'd like to let your listeners know that we'll be adding a new activity this year. We've made an arrangement with the local stable, so now we're going to have horseback riding available for our guests. We've created several riding trails around the lake. That sounds lovely. Now, what about rainy days? What can your guests do when the weather's bad? We have a games room and a crafts room. When the weather's rainy, some of our very talented staff members offer arts and crafts class classes for all ages. What fun! Do you offer any other classes or activities?
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. We have a weekly schedule of evening activities, which anyone can attend if they choose. Every Sunday we show a film, always something that's suitable for the whole family. Monday's my favourite night because that's dessert night. Our cook prepares a variety of desserts, and we get to taste them all. Mmm, I'd like to be there for that. Yes, it's great. We get more serious toward the middle of the week. Our discussion night is on Tuesday. Discussion night? Yes, we discuss different current events, depending on what's happening that week in the news. Then on Wednesdays, we have lectures. We invite different experts to talk about local history or nature topics. This is actually one of our most popular evening activities. We found that our guests are really interested in learning about the local area. It sounds quite interesting. Yes, we've had some excellent speakers. Thursday nights are totally different because that's when we play games. That's especially fun for the children. The children love Fridays too because that's talent show night. Everyone gets in on that. Staff, guests, everyone. It looks like you have a lot of fun at Golden Lake Resort. Fun at Golden Lake Resort. We do. And we end every week with big fun with a dance on Saturday night. Now I understand a little more why Golden Lake is such a popular place for family vacations. With such a variety of activities, there's something for every member of the family there. There is, and I hope your listeners will consider spending their next vacation with us. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two psychology students called Lisa and Greg discussing a project they have to do. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. OK, Greg. So I finally managed to read the article you mentioned. The one about the study on gender and physics. About the study of college students done by Akira Miyake and his team. Yeah, I was interested that the researchers were actually a mix of psychologists and physicists. That's an unusual combination. Yeah. I got a little confused at first about which students the study was based on. They weren't actually majoring in physics. They were majoring in what's known as the STEM disciplines. That's science, technology, engineering and... And math. Yes, but they were all doing physics courses as part of their studies. That's correct. So, as I understood it... Miyaki and co. started from the fact that women are underrepresented in introductory physics courses at college, and also that, on average, the women who do enrol on these courses perform more poorly than the men. No one really knows why this is the case. Yeah, but what the researchers wanted to find out was basically what they could do about the relatively low level of the women's results. But in order to find a solution they needed to find out more about the nature of the problem. Right. Now, let's see if I can remember. It was that in the physics class, the female students thought the male students all assumed that women weren't any good at physics. Was that it? 
and they thought that the men expected them to get poor results in their tests. That's what the women thought, and that made them nervous, so they did get poor results. But actually, they were wrong. No one was making any assumptions about the female students at all. Anyway, what Miyaki's team did was quite simple getting the students to do some writing before they went into the physics class. What did they call it? Values affirmation. They had to write an essay focusing on things that were significant to them, not particularly to do with the subject they were studying, but more general things like music or people who mattered to them. Right. So the idea of doing the writing is that this gets the students thinking in a positive way. And putting these thoughts into words can relax them and help them overcome the psychological factors that lead to poor performance. Yeah. But what the researchers in the study hadn't expected was that this one activity raised the women's physics grades from the C to the B range. A huge change. Pity it wasn't to an A, but still. No, but it does suggest that the women were seriously underperforming beforehand in comparison with the men. Yes. Mind you, Miyaki's article left out a lot of details. Like, did the students do the writing just once or several times? And had they been told why they were doing the writing? That might have affected the results. You mean, if they know the researchers thought it might help them to improve, then they just try to fulfil that expectation? Exactly. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. So anyway, I thought for our project we could do a similar study, but investigate whether it really was the writing activity that had that result. OK, so we could ask them to do a writing task about something completely different, something more factual, like a general knowledge topic. Maybe. Or we could have half the students doing a writing task and half doing something else, like an oral task. Or even half do the same writing task as in the original research and half do a factual writing task. Then we'd see if it really is the topic that made the difference or something else. That's it. Good. So at our meeting with the supervisor on Monday, we can tell him we've decided on our project. We should have our aims ready by then. I suppose we need to read the original study. The article's just a summary. And there was another article I read by Smolinski. It was about her research on how women and men perform in mixed teams in class, compared with single-sex teams and on their own. Let me guess. The women were better at teamwork. That's what I expected. But actually, the men and the women got the same results whether they were working in teams or on their own. But I guess it's not that relevant to us. What worries me, anyway, is how we're going to get everything done in the time. We'll be OK now we know what we're doing. Though I'm not clear how we assess whether the students in our experiment actually make any progress or not. No, we may need some advice on that. The main thing's to make sure we have the right size sample not too big or too small. That shouldn't be difficult. Right, what do we need to do next? We could have a look at the timetable for the science classes, or perhaps we should just make an appointment to see one of the science professors. That'd be better. Great, and we could even get to observe one of the classes. What for? Well, OK, maybe let's just go with your idea. Right, well, I think that's everything for now. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three.
Part 4 You will hear a lecture about the Great Barrier Reef. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Despite its name, the Great Barrier Reef isn't just one large coral reef. Rather, it's a system of coral reefs that stretches along the east coast of Australia, covering an area of around 300,000 square kilometres. The Great Barrier Reef is composed of approximately 3,000 individual reefs, which range in size from one hectare to more than 10,000 hectares each. In addition, around 600 islands are scattered throughout the area, particularly at the northern and southern ends. The reefs themselves are composed of over 400 different kinds of coral, the largest variety of corals found anywhere in the world. Thousands of species of sea animals live in and around the reefs. Altogether, approximately 1,500 species of fish inhabit the reef area, including a number of different kinds of sharks. One of the more interesting mollusks to be found in the reefs is the giant clam. This huge shellfish can live for more than 100 years and can weigh as much as 200 kilos. Sea mammals abound in the area, which serves as a breeding ground for certain types of whales, many of which are endangered. Over 200 species of sea and shorebirds feed, roost or nest among the reefs and islands. Many types of reptiles can also be found living among and near the reefs. Saltwater crocodiles, for example, inhabit the marshes along coastal areas. Amphibians include at least seven species of frogs inhabiting the islands of the reef. Unfortunately, this wondrous area of the world is threatened by climate change. Rising sea temperatures have led to an effect called coral bleaching, that is, large numbers of corals dying off, especially in the shallower areas of the reef. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority is attempting to find effective ways to deal with this issue that threatens the reef. One proposed solution involves shading the reef in certain areas to help keep the surrounding water temperatures down. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Achieving a band score of 9 in IELTS writing requires a combination of strong language skills and effective strategies. Here are some tips to help you. 1. Understand the task. Make sure you understand the task requirements clearly before you start writing. Analyze the prompt carefully and plan your response accordingly. 2. Practice regularly. Regular practice is essential to improve your writing skills. Write essays, reports, and letters on various topics to familiarize yourself with different types of tasks. 3. Focus on coherence and cohesion. Ensure that your ideas are well organized and logically connected. Use cohesive devices such as transition words and linking phrases to create smooth transitions between paragraphs and sentences. 4. Grammar and vocabulary. Use a wide range of grammatical structures and vocabulary appropriately. Avoid repetitive language and errors in grammar and punctuation. 5. Task response. Address all parts of the task prompt and express your ideas clearly and coherently. Stay on topic and provide relevant examples and evidence to support your arguments. 6. Time management. Manage your time effectively during the exam. Allocate enough time for planning, writing, and revising your essay. 7. Seek feedback. Get feedback from teachers, 
tutors, or peers to identify areas for improvement. Use their suggestions to refine your writing skills. 8. Familiarize yourself with the scoring criteria. Understand the criteria used by examiners to assess your writing. Focus on meeting the requirements for each criterion, including task achievement, coherence and cohesion, lexical resource, and grammatical range and accuracy.